Father, we thank you that you want to come and meet us. And so I invite you to anoint my mouth to preach your word, that you would anoint our hearts to hear your word, that you anoint our hands and feet to do your word, that you might be glorified. Praise you, Lord Christ, for your graciousness to meet us yet again. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to invite you to think for a minute about the letters of the New Testament. We call them epistles. And they were letters from the apostles and church leaders to the first century church. And most of these letters that Paul writes in particular are actually to his church plants. See, in the first century, church planting is normal. Paul writes to Thessalonica because he planted this church. And pretty much anywhere outside of Jerusalem, you had to plant a church because there simply wasn't a church there yet. But actually throughout the millennia, church planting has been normal because God is seeking and saving that which is lost. And he is growing and perfecting his bride. Today in Nigeria and Kenya and Uganda, church planting is normal. But here in the West, particularly in America, though the language of church planting is becoming more common, church planting still doesn't feel normal for many people. And so it's easy to miss how church planting is a part of the life and rhythm of the church. And so I want to invite us today to look at Paul's letter to see how church planting might be for Christ Church a rediscovery of important truths that God wants to invite us into to refresh us as he continues to advance his kingdom, his rule and reign here on earth. Well, with every great and important endeavor, there are pitfalls. Nothing that is weighty or significant goes without the real, very real possibility of getting it wrong, dreadfully wrong. And actually, sometimes just that threat, just that weight, can keep us from even trying. But the good news is it never keeps God from doing his work. It never keeps God from continuing to invite us to join him in redeeming the world. Since pitfalls are real, the scriptures are very honest about the hazards and failures of those who join him. Think of the many stories of the scriptures that talk about the heroes of faith. Not one of them escaped failure. Not one of them didn't have botches and mishaps. Actually, you read the book of Genesis and you're amazed <coughs> that God used these folks. Yet he does accomplish his good purposes through the likes of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's amazing to me that he used Jacob. And Paul tells us that he and his companions had suffered much. The words he actually used is that they were treated shamefully in Philippi and have suffered. Now, if you want to get the backstory, Luke, in chapter 16 of his book in Acts, um, tells the story of Paul in Philippi and what happened. But I want to take just a moment. Paul lays a groundwork, an important groundwork for us in 2 Corinthians 10. He says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the war world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The pitfalls that face us in ministry are external and internal. And so let's look more closely at what Paul gives us in this letter. When Paul and Silas traveled to Philippi, they first met a very successful businesswoman. Her name was Lydia, a seller of purple cloth. She responded quickly to the gospel. It looked like Philippi was going to be a really good place. She becomes the first member. She becomes a leader in the church. But as Paul goes to the marketplace to preach, as was his 
have it. A young girl who was demon-possessed and could tell the future started yelling out and being distracting and interrupting Paul as he preached. And so Paul looks and casts the demon out. He delivers this girl. Now, what happens, interestingly, is that delivering a girl from demon possession causes a riot in the city. See, one of the pitfalls that face us is that obedience to God in daily life puts us in spiritual opposition to the realities of this world. You may not realize, but explaining the gospel is spiritual warfare. Why? Well, back to 2 Corinthians. Paul says that the pretenses are opposing knowledge of God. There are principalities and powers at work to obscure and confuse. And when you speak of God's gracious work in Christ Jesus, you are coming into conflict with the many narratives that the enemy sows hide and obscure and deny the truth of the cross. When you share your testimony, you are engaging in spiritual warfare. When you pray, you are engaging in spiritual warfare. When you love your neighbor, you are engaging in spiritual warfare. Whenever your life is in obedience to God and you are living faithfully in the world, you are engaging in spiritual warfare. Because of our very presence, that it is an affront to the powers of this world, simply acts of obedience can be met with strong opposition. And that's what happened to Paul. Delivering this girl brought a riot because the owners of this slave girl realized their cash cow was gone. And so they physically attacked Paul and his companion and then stirred the city up. And Paul and Silas are brought to, uh, taken by the Roman guards and beaten and put in prison just for delivering someone from demon possession. Kingdom living brings us into conflict with power structures that do not like the kingdom of God. And we can anticipate that the response will not be just. Today in India, if you baptize someone, who has become a Christian, both the person that is baptizing and the person being baptized will go to prison. And even though in their constitution they say that they have religious liberty, they are Christians are routinely persecuted for worshiping the God of scriptures. And increasingly facing death threats because of the rise of Hindu nationalism in that country. The spiritual forces behind this persecution are powerful. And malicious. To follow Christ is always to face persecution. There is always a cost in saying yes to Jesus. Whether it's peer pressure, trying to tell you to stop being weird or keep your religion from interfering in life, or actual martyrdom, the way of following Jesus really is always to pick up your cross and follow him. So suffering is a reality for believers. It was a reality for Paul. It's a reality for brothers and sisters around the world who take following Jesus seriously. It will be a reality for you and I. Will we fear suffering? Will that dull our obedience? Will we allow scorn to keep us from being, bringing Jesus to the marketplace of ideas? It's uncomfortable to talk to God about God with gentleness and respect with neighbors who don't feel like they have time or they don't appear to have interest. It's hard work to earn the right to speak to a gay neighbor who has experienced hateful words in the name of religion. We are not called to be a bull in the China, China shop, careless and callous and mean with truth, but winsome and loving and provocative like Jesus was with our family and co-workers and neighbors. But the pitfalls are not only things that we face externally. Paul says in the Corinthian passage that he takes every thought captive. See, the pitfalls are also internal. 
there are many things that can dis to derail our missional life. So let's look at this Thessalonians for a couple of weeks. In our boldness to proclaim the good news, we can miss the message. Sometimes we can mean well, but not actually share the gospel. We can give good advice rather than the gospel. Or we can share something that's close to the gospel, but isn't actually the gospel of grace. When we hear God in his word, or through the leading of that still small voice that says and moves us to share the gospel, it's important that we take time to reflect and let God teach us through our experience. I want, to, I want you to think about how many times you've tried to explain Jesus and you felt like it was muddled. And then ask the question, what did you do next? See, the enemy wants to tell you, see, you did it wrong. You can't do it. That's not your gift. You can't share the gospel. He wants you to hear this and believe those words because if he can muzzle you, you aren't dangerous to him. But the Holy Spirit wants to help us to have eyes to see and ears to hear that we might learn how to communicate and connect better. Debrief your experience with a godly friend or a pastor. Check the scriptures to see how you could speak conversations <coughs> that are winsome. The critical step in discipleship is living a reflective life that it debriefs experiences. St. Ignatius actually came up with a spiritual discipline. He called it the daily examine. It's taking time each day to reflect on what went well and what didn't. And invite the Holy Spirit to speak into your daily life. See, Paul's confidence in verse 3 is not that he is perfect. He is confident that he's speaking the message because he has spent his life in the scriptures. And he had companions and others who would speak the truth with him and to him. They would speak the truth and love to Paul. And he led a life of prayer. So friends, you and I can be good witnesses because we can do this too. In verse 5, Paul says that some act missionally for financial gain. Greed can motivate us in all manner of things, even feigning godliness to make money. In Jesus' day, in Paul's day, in our day, power can come with good speaking ability and a nice religious message. But it's a pitfall, because ministry that's based on anything other than the Lordship of Christ and the cross ultimately war against Jesus' beautiful gospel and will not stand. In verse 6, there's a more subtle temptation. The craving of the approval of men. It's a powerful, powerful motivation. Wanting the approval of others is strong. And it's a temptation for everyone, and it may surprise you, but pastors and teachers and evangelists and church planters are not immune. In fact, the nature of being up front, the nature of leading, makes it an even more dangerous temptation. But spiritual disciplines like silence and solitude are critical to refocus our attention, not on the clamoring voices around us, but on the voice of the Good Savior, the Good Shepherd, who can turn, tune our souls again to what is most important and whose approval is most central. See, spiritual disciplines do not save us, but they bring us to the cross that does. So with so many pitfalls and obstacles, how do we move forward? Paul points out a couple good motives for ministry. First, it's the love of the beauty of the gospel. The good news of Jesus really is good. It is right to be captivated and enthralled by it. A desire for faithful communication of the gospel is a good and right motivation for a missional life. 
As we see the gospel clearly, we often find that we share in God's heart for the lost. See, the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15 is not just about this younger son who said, gee, dad, I wish you were dead, give me, give me my inheritance, and then lives his life in debauchery and makes a muck of it. But it's actually also a story of an older brother who, seeing his younger brother do this, soldiers on, and yet is far away from the heart of the father. Because when the younger son comes back, he's not happy. He doesn't share the heart of the father in seeing the lost found, but he's mad. He has missed what was most important to the father. He never went looking for his brother. He wasn't happy when he returned. Even though he had never run away, he was just as lost as the younger son. So we can be close, but lost when we keep our hearts hard against the things that are make the Father's heart break. Paul says that's his experience, actually, for his relationship with the Thessalonians. He was moved by obedience to share the gospel, but he says, we share the message with you, but we also share our lives because you have become so dear to us. They started out as missional obedient apostles, but they became dear friends. Living a missional life can lead us into greater love because it moves us from self-centered living to risky partnership with God, who is always generously caring for others. When we're caught up in God's good purposes, our daily lives get transformed from the inside out. For Kim and I, this process really took on new life when we became foster parents. It moved us from obedience and theoretical service into deep commitment to the love of the orphan. It was hard work and risky. Eight years we were foster parents, and then we adopted children. And it took prayer and prayer ministry, healing and forgiveness, patience, and a lot of repentance on my part. But the journey humbled us, and God used this journey to pry my fingers of control off of my life and to live into a posture of surrender and trust. Here I will quote Paul in Philippians, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Allow me to point out two church planting principles, which I think can be helpful for this congregation. First, when you're church planting, you have no church, no building, and no programs. And the simplicity of that ministry, of that way of planting, keeps the main thing the main thing. You don't need to fill a building. And so, being about seeing people's lives changed and lost people come to faith is easy because there's no electricity, no electric bills I need to worry about, not worrying about all kinds of other things. But I don't think you have to sell this building in order to become fresh, being refreshed in making the main thing the main thing. Oh, by the way, the main thing is not have a building. The main thing is that God is seeking and saving that which is lost and perfecting his bride. Second, there is a tension for believers. And when you're church planting and you don't have a building to gather people in, we church planters, we don't feel this tension. But there is a beautiful tension between worship and mission. They can't be done simultaneously. There are two important realities that both must be done really well. And for some reason in Christendom, we have all often made them in opposition but they are not in opposition, they're in dynamic relationship. Because, as the post-communion prayer says, you've said it over and over again, but let me remind you of what it says. You have fed us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of our Savior, and so send us out to do the work you have given us to do. See, we need worship. God doesn't need our worship. He's not lacking anything. He doesn't enjoy it. 
But coming to worship aligns us and renews us and refreshes us. And having been filled with this spirit, we are fit for service. So the sending is the fruit of the filling. And being sent in God's mission is good for us because left to ourselves, left to myself, I would live a selfish, self-centered life. I'd make everything during the week about me. But being involved in Jesus' work allows me to be saved from my carnal heart. So this gather-and-go rhythm that God has put in the design of his worship and his sending keeps us in a healthy rhythm. Some of us forget to eat, and we run out of gas. So come and feast on the real bread of heaven. Some of us forget that this great feasting is actually to empower you and energize you for gracious work of loving others. So I'd like to give you a couple details about your church plant. Where? Where are we church planting? I'm living in Springfield, and we're reaching out to the neighborhood of Springfield. It's a one-square-mile neighborhood. And we're looking to reach out to North Jacksonville because north of downtown, there is not an Anglican church. There's no liturgical church that's preaching the gospel. And so that is our target. What are we doing? Well, right now we're praying. Right now we're digging into scripture and learning how to be a learning community together. Right now, we're trying to connect with neighbors, particularly through an organization called SPAR. It's a community service organization, the Springfield Preservation and Restoration Corporation. And it's an opportunity to meet people and build relationships. And this Advent, we're planning on using this season to connect more with people that we have made relationships with. I'll update you on that as it continues to develop. So when is this happening? Well, the second Monday, of the month. At 7 o'clock, we're doing Bible dig-ins. And anyone who's interested may join us. But we're targeting the people that we've built relationships with to invite them to this, a, pl a place where we want to practice digging the scripture well, enjoying learning the Bible. It's very discussion-oriented, and it is practicing us being a learning community. The last Monday of the month, is a prayer meeting where we're praying for Springfield and the church plant. And we're listening, and we're asking the Holy Spirit to speak to us as a community about how he wants to lead. And during Advent, which we know when that starts, uh, during Advent, we don't know yet what it will be, but we will be doing something maybe like home church in Springfield. So what's the involvement of Christ Church in her plan? The first is that I invite you to pray. I invite you to join us on Mondays, the last Monday of the month. I invite you to pray for us whenever you think. Luke 10, 2 says, Pray the Lord of the harvest to send labors to the harvest field. I pray that every day. I pray that not only for the church plants in Springfield, but the other church planters in our diocese. And pray for conversions. God is seeking and saving the lost. I want to be involved in what he's doing in seeking and saving the lost. Second, I want to invite you to consider joining the church plant launch team. I don't know if some of you, God is stirring to be not just a encourager, but one who would actually join us and be part of what we're doing in Springfield itself. If you'd like to know more about what that might look like, you can talk to me after the service. And third, I want to invite you that because I won't have a congregation or it's going to be extremely small, that I continue to raise support to make this happen. And I'd invite you to give to the church plant ministry as a gift over and above your regular church plant, your regular church time. I can, I can say this. You don't rob, rob Peter to pay Paul. You don't rob Matt to pay Paul. If Christ Church isn't healthy and vibrant and cared for, then the church plant can't be cared for. So don't take your tithe and give it to the church plant. 
pray and ask God to provide, and let him lead you to give a, a gift that is additional and above and beyond how God's calling you to steward his resources here at Christ Church. Finally, to close, I want to invite you to think about what God is opening the doors for in this church, in this new season. We're coming to a place where we're learning how to regather, what it looks like now. And things aren't going to be the same. When we come back into life, what is the new normal? Are you seeing obstacles or are you seeing opportunities? I want to invite you to have a church planter's heart for Christ Church in this new season. You have had this heart. Celebrate Recovery is a practical expression of how this church has had this heart. Taking a risk to serve the real needs of people and to think outside the box and to do church differently is one way that Christ Church has already had a church planting heart and has lived that out. What are the needs? What are the hurdles? What are the possibilities? What does bringing the gospel in new circumstances look for us in this new season? You and I need a church planting heart to let this new season of ministry be an opportunity for possibility. Are we willing to try new things for the sake of the gospel? There's a real chance that we could mess it up, but we serve a God who can use even the likes of us. So have courage and join him as he continues to move his mission forward to seek and save the lost and to purify his bride. Amen.